burned nearly three days in this conference. And we talked about black hole this, black hole that, etc. Not once did anybody say that these are black hole candidates. As far as I know, everybody just takes it for granted that they are black holes. But how do we really know that they are black holes? I mean, let's just ask, what do we know? We know that they are compact. They are producing all this you know, bright radiation, x-rays, etc., etc. And you can get some rough idea of their size. They are probably less than a few Schwarzschild radii. This we are pretty confident. And of course, they are all massive. Greater than three solar masses, you know, we know that we cannot make neutron stars. And so we kind of, by default, we call them black holes. But at some point, we have to kind of step back and say, can we find some kind of proof positive that they are black holes? And you all remember, the way we define a black hole is an object in which all the masses collapse into a singularity and leaves behind this event horizon. Stuff can fall in, nothing comes out, no surface. Can we actually verify this? And I think this is a basic and important question. I'm not saying it's a central question in this field, but you know, it's something that we really need to wrap up, even while we are talking about all the good stuff that we discussed at this meeting. And accretion actually is a very nice way of trying to explore this question, because the very good thing about accretion, in fact, Andy made this point, that gas which is radiating is right close to this black hole. It's right near the horizon. So, you know, here is all this gas, and mostly I'm going to be talking about X-ray binaries today. I will have a little bit to say about the galactic center. Okay, so there's all this gas coming right to the center, and the gas certainly can tell the difference, whether it's falling into a black hole or it's falling onto, let us say, a neutron star, or a big fat neutron star with a surface. And we are getting radiation from that region right near the center. And so, you know, one thinks that in principle, by interpreting what we see, we ought to be able to tell the difference between objects that have a surface and objects that don't, namely that have a horizon. And X-ray binaries have this additional advantage that we have these two kinds of binaries, a large number of neutron star binaries and a pretty good population of black hole systems, or rather black hole candidate systems. And so we can look for differences. This is a nice control sample. This is the guy that we want to study. So that's kind of the motivation for all this. Surprisingly, this, this whole question, you know, can we tell whether these guys have got horizons for some reason, I think people had not really considered it seriously until Mike Garcia, Jeff McClintock, and I just you know, posed this question to ourselves. Can we use what we know about X-ray binaries to look for evidence of the horizon? That's where this game started in terms of a serious study. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the argument that we presented, the data we presented, and where we have come so far. But then there have been a number of other arguments actually quite independent, and some of them are very, very different. There's something based on variability spectra, something based on X-ray bursts. I've just listed these in uh, chronological order based on the year of publication. And I hope, I'm not sure how much time I'll have, I'm going to try and say at least a few words about each of these methods. But you know, if I run out of time, please forgive me. I may only do four or five of these. So. I'm going to start off with just showing some data before even coming down to the picture that we have. Okay? So this was the first study, Narayan Garcia and McClintock, 97. We looked at neutron star and black hole X-ray binaries. We went and looked at them in quiescence. These are all transient systems. So we went to look at them in their quiescent state. We predicted, based on our you know, understanding of what goes on in terms of accretion here, we predicted that the black holes in quiescence would be a lot dimmer than the neutron stars. Black holes are supposed to be black, and we said they would be really black when you look at them in quiescence. So this was the data that we had to start with. So we had at that time, 97, four black holes, two of which had detected fluxes from which we calculated luminosities, two had only upper limits, we had five neutron stars, and in each system in this plot, you're just plotting the quiescent luminosity divided by this maximum luminosity when the thing was an outburst. Nice, good, dimensionless number. Just look at it. And of course, we were very happy to see that the black holes were all dimmer than the neutron stars. Of course, it was a little worrying that you know they're getting pretty close here. But still, you know, this is orders of magnitude. It's a log scale. Okay, so this looks pretty good. This is another way of plotting this. So then the question is, can we do better than this? And obviously, for the last ten years, we have been trying to do better. It's been getting better, bit by bit. This is 97. This is a different kind of plot. Again, I will explain why we plot it like this in, in just about five minutes. But here again, the dark 
dots are the black holes, the open circles are the neutron stars. This is 2000. Enormous difference between 2000 and 2002 when Chandra came online, and that is the paper Garcia et al., in which we made a real quantum leap, I think, in this business, got a lot more data, and things have got even a little better by now, though not that much between 2002 and 2007. So this first test, which I haven't yet told you how the test works, but I'm just showing you the data. The data clearly tell you that quiescent X-ray binaries with black holes are very, very different from the guys with neutron stars. So again, this is luminosity. Now it's in Eddington units, log L over L led. I've just drawn these hatch lines to kind of lead you just to see that all the neutron stars are here in this band. All the black holes are here. And the difference is about two and a half orders of magnitude. Big, big factor. So let me now come to you know what is the motiv motivation behind these kinds of comparisons. So the basic idea is the following. If you've got accretion and the gas falls on an object with a surface, then that surface will radiate. I mean, we all know this for the standard thin accretion disk. If you drop gas onto a mass M of radius R, roughly GM over R is the amount of energy you release per gram. And in the simplest models, 50% comes from the disk and 50% comes from the surface. So, you know, roughly equal amounts. So, you know, this is where our efficiencies come for typical radii. 10% efficiency, 0.1 m dot c squared from the disk another 0.1 m dot c squared from the surface, and this is what we expect. So just in terms of the total luminosity, this, this simple idea would tell us that all things being equal, the guy with the surface will be twice as bright as the guy without the surface. That's not very good. You know, it's not good for a quantitative test. I'm going to do better soon. But it also says that the system with the surface will have two kinds of radiation. There'll be radiation from the disk of the kind that Jeff described, you know, nice black body radiation, multicolor, etc., And there'll be some other kind of black body radiation, black body light coming from the neutron star in this case. And you can look for evidence for two comp components in the radiation. I'm going to come to this because two of the tests are based on this idea. But I want to first talk about the idea we worked with, which was to look at a different kind of an accretion flow. And that is these ADAFs. So the ADAFs are, you know, these, these, these lovely accretion flows. In fact, the picture is probably not very good. I just wanted to use the same picture. These are these lovely accretion flows where you can have a lot of M dot coming in and hardly any radiation coming out. They're just storing all the energy in the gas and it's just coming in with a huge amount of thermal energy. So the luminosity of the disk is very much less than 0.1 M dot C squared. Kind of by definition what an ADAF is all about. And, you know, we have a lot of uh, reason to believe you know, as Andy explained, there is probably some doubt on whether these things apply to low state or not. I think they do, but definitely I think I would be pretty confident that the ADAF kind of picture is certainly valid for quiescent state when the accretion rate is very, very low. So let's imagine that we have a system with an ADAF supplying gas to a central star. If the central star has a surface, when the gas hits the surface, all that energy has to come out because it has nowhere else to go just steady state, you're going to get all of this released energy back out to infinity. You'll get a bright system with a luminosity on the order of, let us say, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 m dot c squared. If this guy does not have a surface but has a horizon, then all of this stored thermal energy will just go through the horizon and disappear along with the gas. And what you'll get is a system in which all you see is the disk luminosity, which is a lot less than m dot c squared. So therefore, the prediction is look at quiescent systems where we think you might have an ADAF. In those systems, if you try and get things all set up in equivalent ways, the neutron star systems will be orders of magnitude brighter than the black holes. So you know, it's a simple consequence of this whole picture. So the key is how do we constrain m dot? Because you know, all these statements are L is of order some m dot c squared or much less than m dot c squared. You need to know m dot to do this test. And I'm going to give you two kinds of arguments. The galactic center, I'm going to give you an argument in which I actually know, at least I have some constraints on M dot. But to start with, I'm going to talk about this work that, that uh, Jeff and Mike and I did, where we used neutron stars as our comparison sample. 